Um, I'm used to saying you take your hymnals and turn it right to a number, but we've got to take your Bibles and turn to a book of the Bible, uh, Psalm 119. It's been a couple weeks since we've had the opportunity to go over uh, our Scripture memory, and uh, so, but we'll just touch on the last two verses, uh, the ones from last week, uh, which uh, end a, an eight-verse section, and then we'll go right into the new section that we have, um, which is 18, the 18th section. We're already there. And uh, so let's take a look at, the, at last week's and reviewing those, which are verses 135 and 136. Let's all say it with the reference before and after, and we'll go through these verses and uh, thinking through what God has for us in them. Psalm 119, 135 and 136. 119. To shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. Psalm 119, 135, and 136. Um, it's interesting that the next two verses that start the, uh, this next section um, are couched be- right after that, saying the rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. We have this disturbing verse there, and the next verse for, um, that would be for the following week says, My zeal hath consumed me because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. And so we have error and error, but couched in the middle we have these two verses uh, that we are going to look at this week. And it says this, this, Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. In the midst of um, a world that seems to have God's word wrong and is um, in setting it at naught and setting it aside, discrediting it, uh, speaking against it, uh, we can know that even in the midst of that culture that is antagonistic to God's word, we can know that God's words are still right and righteous altogether. And, um, and we see this over and again. What's interesting, too, about this section is that this letter of the alphabet, this Tzadi, if you, look, if you have that in your Bibles uh, there, that 18th letter of the uh, Hebrew alphabet, uh, it's, it's basically a word that's kind of a root word for the Hebrew word righteous. And so that is a theme word in this section. We have it in this first verse, and it's uh, in the second verse, and then we have it down in verses 142 a couple of times, and then 144. Over and again in this section, we are called to remember that God's Word is righteous, that God Himself is righteous. His testimonies are righteous, and all of these are perfect. And it's because they all come from God, and all that He does and all that He says, all that He records is right in righteous altogether. So righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Let's say these verses together, starting and ending again with the reference. Psalm 119, 137, and 138. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Psalm 119, 137, and 138. Uh, Amen. We're going to turn things over to Pastor for our announcements, and uh, we'll get started with our service. Why is it that we hide God's Word in our heart so that we don't sin against Him? And so the direct correlation of how desperately we want God's help to keep us from sin is how passionately we, pers- we pursue the memorizing of his word. Is that not convicting? And uh, oftentimes we just get into these habits of life and we just go through the mundane habits and uh, part of that is not a discipline to memorize God's word as we should or could. And so uh, these are opportunities for us as a church to just embrace uh, some church, uh, some verse memory and uh, grow as a church as well as individually in our spiritual walks. Well, we are honored to have the Pittmans with us tonight and uh, this family has won a special place Uh, in your pastor's heart. I had the privilege of interviewing them with Baptist World. And then this last week, I had the privilege of preaching to them uh, at the Baptist World orientation. And and so we are delighted to have them with us. And uh, they were missionaries for years on the field, seven years, if I remember right. 
and uh, they had to come off the field in a change of mission board, and now they're finishing up their support and want to get back uh, to the Dominican Republic. And so we are excited about having them here. Brother Adam is teaching his boys properly. He's teaching them to love hunting. And so I said, when you come to our church, you will have to stay with me. And, um, and I will take you on a tour through the mounts and tell the stories and, um, and uh, maybe even show them some of the arsenal. But uh, lots of fun stuff, and uh, we are excited about having them with us. You uh, will find out very quickly as you interact with them, these are choice servants of God. And uh, God has put his hand of special blessing upon them, and uh, we are blessed to have them with us tonight. I know your heart will be stirred. We're going to pack a lot into tonight, so we're going to keep things moving right along. But let me just say, by way of announcement, Tuesday is our Faith Family Breakfast at Haney's. And uh, if you can join uh, the, the church family at 9 o'clock, it is always a great time of fellowship, a great time of encouragement uh, to the Haney's. And uh, we're so thankful uh, for that opportunity. And then super seniors, remember your activity has been changed. See the uh, one stop for some of the details as to uh, what's going to go on in a game night here and uh, spaghetti dinner. And so it'll be a great time for all of our super seniors to uh, play some games together, enjoy some fellowship and some food. And uh, we are looking forward uh, to that. I hope that you'll uh, plan that on your calendar. Do remember that there are still some uh, individuals, some precious children uh, to be adopted. Uh, if the Lord directs you that way, uh, that you will uh, see Debbie Lerse and her team of helpers there if uh, the Lord has laid upon you. I know a number, 43 adopted one last year, and I think a number of people have already adopted this year. A number of people are praying about it, and uh, I do think it is a great way for Faith Baptist Church to reach in uh, to some of these communities around the world and uh, present the gospel to those who may never have a chance to hear it uh, if we don't provide the avenue and opportunities for them. And so what a great privilege and opportunity for us. Let's bow our heads and pray together. We'll sing some songs to get into the service tonight. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for our salvation in Christ. Thank you for the opportunity that you give to us to learn about you, to understand better your character as you have revealed it in your word, and to allow it to be manifested in our behavior and in our attitudes. Lord, I pray that you would change us for your glory. We are so thankful to have missionaries in our church. It is our joy to support them, to uh, team up with them, to partner with them for the spreading of the gospel and the planting of churches all over the world. We thank you for the Pittman family. Thank you for your hand of blessing upon their lives and their ministry. I am so excited about having them present the burden of their heart and the call of God upon their lives. And I pray that you would use it in our hearts as we look forward to what you would have for us in their ministry. We thank God for the opportunity that you've given to us tonight to honor uh, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and to reflect on the amazing price that was paid in our place and the grace that was extended to us in the forgiveness of our sin and the eternal home in heaven, the relationship that we can have now and forever with Christ. So I pray, God, that in every part of the service tonight, you would be put on display in all of your glory, and we'll certainly thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. 310. The old rugged cross, we'll just sing the first verse together and then we'll, if you're in your hymnal, right across the hymnal is the next song in the cross of Christ I glory. We'll go from one right to the other as we sing about our Savior's death for us. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the and shame and 
and I love that old cross where the dear emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dear emblem of I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. A few pages early, 283, lift up the cross. Lift up the cross, lift up the cross, till every eye has seen the Lamb of Calvary. Lift up the cross, lift up the cross, exalt the Son of God who died. Take up his cross and lift it. Till every eye has seen the Lord Lift up the cross Amen. You may be seated. Amen. An opportunity for us to participate in God's design of the local church in giving and providing uh, for the needs of the church and participating in the burden and the carrying of it by faithfully obeying the Lord in what we do with what he has entrusted to us. I do hope that you do not just endure the time of the offering. Uh, my heart's desire is that it is a time of worship, that you actually reflect back on what God has entrusted to you and that he has given to you by his grace because he trusts you. And that is our privilege to then manifest our obedience and our love to him by faithfully doing what he asks us to do with what he has given to us. Eric, would you pray? Ask God's blessing, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for that old rugged cross. We thank you for our Savior who gave his life for us. We thank you tonight, Lord, for our salvation. We joy in that. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the compassion you've had on us, Lord, as lost sinners. We thank you for saving those here that are saved. I thank you, Lord, for my salvation. I thank you, Lord, for the mercies of God. I thank you for the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives us, Lord. And we trust, Lord, that you'll give us wisdom to do with these tithes, gifts, and offerings, Lord, uh, what you see fit. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.
And thank you, Bernie. A wonderful, powerful song, a mighty fortress that God is to us. He never fails, and he is the one who is stronger than all the, uh, the things of this world that go against his name and against his word. And yet only just one word will fell uh, the attacks of uh, Satan that he has surmounted against us. Let's go ahead and stand one more time. We'll sing a, uh, we're going to sing two songs, but we're going to sing one verse of Beneath the Cross of Jesus and over on page 284, and then we're going to go to another uh, number and come then right back to Beneath the Cross of Jesus. So we'll sing two verses, but we'll put a song in between. Beneath the Cross of Jesus, number 284. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon. the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Almighty Cross number 291. I hope you will take the time to go by the Pittman's table, pick up a prayer card, and get to know them personally. Your life will be enriched by theirs. This is a family that loves Jesus Christ and have been called of God and given their lives to service to him. And we're looking forward to hearing from them. Adam, won't you come, share your burden, share God's word with us. Second Corinthians 5, 9 says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. My name is Adam Pittman, and I want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share our burden of labor, and we make it our mission to be pleasing to the Lord. 
Along with my wife Jody and our three kids, we have had the privilege of serving as missionaries to the Dominican Republic for the past six years. We are sent out by our home church, Heritage Hills Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and serve alongside Baptist World Mission. God called our family to the Dominican Republic in the summer of 2013. Um, we, we heard a plea from a Dominican pastor calling for missionaries to come and plant churches in the 13 provinces where there are no good Baptist churches. The heart of our team is church planting and this presented us with a great need and a great opportunity. Um, in, after coming to the country and going around and seeing the different cities and uh, the needs, Lord directed us to the city of Puerto Plata, um, where we began ministering in the year 2015. Puerto Plata has a population of about 160,000 and is in the top 10 largest cities in the country. With its golden sands and mountainous natural landscapes, combined with the turquoise of the water, Puerto Plata is a top-rated tourist destination. While most would envision life on a tropical island, we see the life of the everyday Dominican. Though the majority of the island would claim Roman Catholicism, Puerto Platanians pride themselves in evangelicalism, and most attend one of the dozens of Pentecostal churches you will find on just about every corner. Soy Cristiano, or I am a Christian, is the common response you'll get from when you ask someone what they believe. Unfortunately, most don't really understand what it really means. Uh, Iglesia Bautista Vista Mar Ocean View Baptist Church was begun by a veteran missionary in the year 2015. We uh, met him in 2016 and the Lord began to uh, burden both of us uh, for the needs of, of this area and he presented the opportunity for us to take over the ministry as he moved to a different uh, location within the country. God makes no mistakes, and we thank Him for opening this door of opportunity for ministry with Ocean View Baptist Church. For any new plant to grow, there must be patience and care and time and work and the right location. And not all plants are going to look the same or grow alike. We feel like the same can be said about a new church plant. Since 2015, we have served through teaching discipleship, evangelism, and children's ministry. The burden of our team is to train Dominicans to be the next generation of leaders in the church. Growth doesn't always mean numbers, but a change of heart. As we have preached, discipled, and taught, evangelized, and prayed, we wait for God to do the work as only He can in the heart of His people. Adult ministry is a large part of our ministry here at the church um, through counseling and teaching families how to apply biblical principles um, gives us opportunities within their daily lives. Through preaching and weekly discipleships, we continue to pray for the spiritual growth amongst the members. Even through figuring out life through lockdown, uh, restrictions, and many other measures, uh, God opened the door for us to get to know uh, our neighbors and also the teens of our neighborhood. We started a youth outreach even through restrictions and began seeing relationships, discipleships, and Bible studies form. God is good and uses the unknown to teach us to trust Him. Children are an important part of the ministry of our church, and we saw a need to start a Bible club. CluCESP has allowed for weekly teaching, crafts, games, and learning biblical principles. We have seen kids come to know Christ and begin Bible studies, which we pray will in turn be the future leaders of the church. It's very important to us to have our kids a part of the ministry and to see how God works in people's lives. Judson, Declan, and Elena all enjoy being active within the church and life here in the Dominican. My name is Judson. I got saved when I was four and now I'm eight, and what I love about the Dominican is that getting people saved and just being a missionary and letting people go to church, inviting them, and, 
and I like dogs and other animals. I like catching them too. And what I like about the Dominican is a lot of their food and having other people come over. Oye Israel, el vino se dio el vino es. That's one of the verses I learned in church. Hi, my name is Declan and I, and I got saved when I was four years old. And I like comedians, I like to work and I like to like event stuff and other stuff. And that uh, missionaries help people get saved and I like to eat. I like to eat shrimp and noodles and I like to eat some seafood and I like to go to places like restaurants and I like to go to like the water parks. Those are my favorite parts of like the Dominican. I like to learn speaking Spanish. I like to see fish when I go to the beach. I like to work and do stuff with my hands. I'm Lana and I'm three years old and I like warm hugs and purple and pink. And um, flies and one hugs and bye bye. So unfortunately, as he was saying, we were at our. Uh, our orientation there at Camp Joy and so our daughter stayed back in North Carolina because she was going to be staying with strangers and she doesn't do too well with that and so we left her back in North Carolina but you got to see a little bit of her personality coming out there now we can add flamingos because apparently they're beautiful because and so she loves flamingos as well now but uh, there in the Dominican Republic God called us there and one of the first questions that people ask us after seeing the video and I guess I could have explained it a little bit better is we are actually a church merger there on the field. We were beginning our ministry there on the western side of the city and this missionary had come in and was starting a ministry on the eastern side of the city and he was having some health troubles and was moving to a different city. So we kind of incorporated them into uh, our ministry and began uh, working together under the, the name Iglesia Bautista Vista Mar there in 2017. And so we were excited to be able to add those people to the ministry and continue moving forward. And just really, really neat uh, things happening there in the Dominican Republic. Uh, as many people ask us, like, how did you handle COVID? And one of my encouraging, my moments of trying to encourage people is for us, it was a real blessing. Um, when I think about COVID, I don't want to think about it as a blessing, but the Lord really began to work during that time, and we saw uh, many relationships built during that time. We saw three teenagers come to know Christ during that time. We saw three young children come to know Christ, and several families began attending the, the church right after the lockdowns, because for us, it was really difficult. Um, I know here in the United States it was different location by location, but for us, the entire country of the Dominican Republic overnight shut down. We had a curfew put in place. We could only be out and about from 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. on weekdays and from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. on weekends. And nothing was open but grocery stores, pharmacies, and the hospital. And so we avoided the hospital and we took trips to the grocery store just to get out of the house. But it opened up opportunities. We had people standing in front of our home, just sitting around, just looking for things to do opened up opportunities for us to go out and be able to share uh, who we were and what we were doing there in the Dominican Republic to be able to share the gospel with them. And every third Friday of the month, we were having an evangelistic service there with these teenagers and just seeing upwards of 30 kids in our home just coming for this evangelistic service and being able to see Christ touch the lives of these three young people. And then really neat, on uh, Easter Sunday, we were able to baptize two young people we uh, added some to the, the membership there, a family that has been coming even since we have been home on furlough, who has been a real blessing there in the, in the church and just really excited to see what God is doing. But in the coming uh, months, when we get back, we're looking to start a secondary Bible study across town and begin to look at a secondary ministry 
uh, there in the city of Puerto Plata to begin to look at a second church and begin to see what the Lord's going to be doing in the future and just seeing about uh, our team splitting up. You saw uh, the picture of our group were a team of four couples. Uh, one of the couples had to stay home due to health troubles, and so they're staying home and working with our sending church, but the four couples are still on the field working together, and two couples would then break off and begin a, a secondary ministry. And it's just a really neat thing that we see in Scripture where Paul would take a team with him, would break off, and they would continue different ministries. And so just a real encouragement for us, for our kids, to be able to see that straight from the, straight from the beginning, to not have that culture shock, not have just moving to a new location and not knowing anyone. And so we're really excited to see what the Lord's going to be doing in the coming months there in the Dominican Republic. But uh, another thing that we often like to share is the difficulties that it might be ministering in a predominantly Pentecostal environment. Uh, Roman Catholicism being the predominant religion there in the Dominican Republic, but in Puerto Plata being Pentecostalism. We've had a family that's been coming to our church for four years now. We were um, training them up and you know, they, they would have their ups and their downs, but then at the end of last year, they came to the leadership and were like, we just can't get over eternal security. You know, we, we've been taught that you can lose your salvation, and, and so they left the church. This is a couple that we had invested four years into their lives, and just like that, they were gone. But because of that investment, you know, uh, a couple weeks back, they decided to return to the church we're beginning to uh, work with them on doing Bible studies and different um, training opportunities, but just be praying in the lives of those people because for them it's a complete change of culture to follow the Bible because their entire life they've been trained that, you know, the Christian life is maintained by works. And so we're coming in and saying the Bible teaches otherwise, that Christ paid it all and it's by faith and faith alone and yes, as believers, we're called to live a life that is godly before the Lord, but Christ did the payment for us. And so um, we're just praying for that. And one last thing to be praying about for us is we're having, we start, restarted our kids program. We call it CESP. It's kind of like Awanas. We do it on Saturday afternoons. And praise the Lord, we were able to do it. It's been two years uh, since we were able to do it. Um, and we restarted that in March almost two years to the day that we had to stop due to the lockdowns. And so uh, the Lord really blessed in that. But we're having trouble with one of our neighbors. She already had trouble with the church. She doesn't like the church. And so she's threatening to call the police because the kids are making too much noise. Well, you know, ministry is, is like that. We're going to have those people that just come alongside and just love on you. And then you have those that are going to put themselves against the church. And so we're just praying that the Lord would just work that out, that we would be holding our testimony in dealing with her, but that, you know, Christ would do a work in her life and that she would come to that understanding um, to allow the ministry to go on unhindered. And so we're asking for prayer in that aspect so that that could be cleared up and we can continue the ministry there at the church. And so um, that's a little bit about our ministry. Before we get into the Word, are there any questions that somebody might have about something that we may not have, we touched on or may not have clarified? I guess we did a good job, all right? <laughs> all right, if you would, take your Bibles and open to Ephesians chapter 5. I was at Camp Joy and... Your pastor was opening up to Ephesians, and I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and so uh, Ephesians chapter 5, he didn't touch on, on exactly this. He only had two, two days, so he had to do a, uh, a sprint across Ephesians. And so uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and opening up with verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Let's open in a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, Lord, would you come before you right now? Just thankful for your word, Father. We're thankful for um, Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and what that means for us as believers, that we can come by faith and put our trust in Christ and become, be transformed into new creatures, Father. And Lord, we're just thankful for uh, your Holy Spirit and the work that, it does, that he does in our lives, Lord. And we just pray that you would just be opening each one of our ears and our hearts, Father, to your word and allowing your word to touch us, to transform us, and to mold us more in the image of Christ. And 
We just pray for this church and their ministry here. We just pray that you would put your blessings upon it. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. So here we see a command given in Scripture for every believer. It's not something that's given just to the Ephesian church. It's not a command only given to the pastors, the deacons, or those who choose to. But here in verse 8, we see a challenge given by the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus that we are to walk as children of light. But the question that I ask you today is, how bright is your light shining? How bright is your light shining? Because as believers, we know that Christ gave that example um, when he started talking about the growth of different believers, that there were going to be some that were going to give 30, some that were going to produce 60, and some that were going to produce 100. But how bright is your light shining to others in a world that needs light? Because when we go out into the world, do we expect them to find Christ just by walking around? Romans tells us that when we go out in nature, and I know Pastor Berlin and I have spent many a time in nature, and we can see God in all that nature has. You can be sitting in the trees and just looking at the different aspects of it. You can see a deer coming down and just just that, that hearing it coming and then seeing it and the different animals coming in the woods. You can see that there was a brilliant God behind that that put all that into motion. But that is not enough to draw a person to the understanding of who the true God is. That is only going to happen looking into God's Word and through the lives of those who have studied it, who have been transformed by it, and we see, for sometimes in dark it, that ye be children of light, walk as children of light. Okay, so what does that look like? What does it look like to walk as a children of light? Because, I mean, we're not going to go put on the brightest clothes that we can. My, my church in the Dominican oftentimes does. Like Latin culture, you know, it's the brightest outfit that you can get, and that's going to be, you know, and it's like, whoo! You know, sometimes you have to put sunglasses on to go to church, and I'm just like, that's a bright shirt. But, uh, um... But it's, it's great, you know, but here, walk as children of light. What does that mean? What does it mean to walk as a child of light? All right, so we're going to go back to verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 5, and it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. The first thing that we see in order to walk as children of light, we need to be walking in love. We need to be demonstrating the love of Christ to others. That is something that as churches across the United States is lacking in our dealings with the people of this world. We oftentimes look at it, and one of the things in the Dominican Republic that I have to deal with with my church is that in a Latin culture, Homosexuality is viewed as like the most heinous sin that you can, you can commit. Now, the Bible teaches against it, but I look at them and I say, if, if I put a person that committed adultery right here, and I put a homosexual sitting right beside of him, how many of y'all would treat one better than the other? And so many of them began to, to think about it because they didn't want to say, oh, I'm going to treat an adulterous person well. But I began to say, both of them need Christ. Both of them have committed a sin against God, but we have elevated this sin above all things and almost make it to where we lose our testimony when we're dealing with these people. It's looking at them and saying, Christ loved the publicans and the sinners. That didn't mean that he condoned the sins that they were committing, but he loved them and he showed them that love and saying, you need to change your life because God is wanting to have a part of your life. And I love you even as Christ loves you, and I want to show you how you can have a relationship with God. Oftentimes we look at these people, and in the Dominican Republic, that's how it is. They'll look at somebody and they'll be like, oh no, I don't want to talk to that person because somebody might think that I'm the same way. But if you're living a life that is godly before the Lord and others are watching you and they're saying, I know what that person believes. I know that they live out a life that is godly before the Lord. They're not going to question when you're dealing with somebody who's living in sin. 
When you're talking to them and you're saying, this is something that cannot be, this is something that God wants to change in your life and he wants to have a relationship with you, that's going to be the farthest thing from your mind is what other people are thinking about you. You're going to be thinking about others saying Christ needs to be transforming the life of this person. This person needs to understand who God is. And we're going to understand that what Christ did was leave heaven, came down and was born of Mary through the virgin birth, lived a sinless life, and was crucified for our sins. And on the third day rose again so that we could have a relationship with God. When we fully understand what Christ did for us, that's going to change our perspective of what other people did. What other what, what, our, what we did to Christ and what we need to do to others, what we need to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others in love, telling them that we love them. We don't, we don't care for their sin, but we love them. We need to be walking in love, taking into account what Christ did for us and saying, if Christ can love me, a sinner, the least I can do is go out and reach others, show them love and to show them back to the cross that saved me. I thank God every day for my father who took the time every day, even up to age five when I accepted Christ as my savior, to share the gospel with me. If my dad wasn't faithful to share the gospel with me, I might not have come to know Christ as my savior. My father loved me enough to share the truth with me. And that's something that, that convicts me oftentimes is, do I love the people that I'm talking to, enough to share the same message that was shared with me? Am I going to take a few minutes just to tell somebody that Christ loves them and wants to have a relationship with them? When I begin to see that this person might not go into eternity unless I speak to, um, into eternity prepared to meet Christ because I didn't take a few minutes to share with them the gospel, that should challenge me to open up the Word of God and to begin to share with that person and say, I don't want you to go out today and to lose your life and to spend an eternity separated from God simply because I loved my time more than I loved you. As children of light, we need to be living a life of love, loving others as Christ loved us. Walking as, cho as children of light requires us to walk in love. Because it says in verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolishness, nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger or unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. The people who are practicing these things, the people who take joy in these things, they cannot have a relationship with God because they are, uh, they are committed to their own gods. And we need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. The next thing we see... Um, that in order to walk as children of light, we see in verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is an acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So we need to be walking in love, but then we need to be separating from sin. Okay, so I love the person, but I'm not going to condone what they're doing. I'm going to be separated from sin, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We live in a world of sin and every type of debauchery that you can imagine. We live in a world of distractions. They're trying to distract you from everything by throwing every type of fleshly, pleasing thing at you. But we as believers should be looking at the Word of God and saying, I want to be more like Christ. And how do I do that? By avoiding the unfruitful works of darkness. By being separated from sin. By saying, when my friends are talking ugly, I'm going to say, you shouldn't be doing that because my Bible says that I should be only speaking those things that are pleasing to my Father and talking about other people or saying ugly things. Those things should not be coming out of my mouth because I am one who have put my faith and trust in Christ Jesus. By separating ourselves from those who say that they are believers, but in reality by their practices 
are doing all the things that the Bible says a believer should not do. By being a light to the world through our actions. In the Dominican Republic, I'll go and I'll be evangelizing and I'll go and meet with somebody and they'll be drinking a beer. That's the Dominican thing. Where they'll just be sitting out on the street and they'll be drinking either a beer or a rum or whatever and they're just sitting there just listening to music and drinking. And I'll come up and I'll say, hi, I'm Pastor Adan, Pastor Adam. And what's the first thing that happens? All the things that they're ashamed of get tucked away. Why? Because the Dominican people are very religious, and when they hear pastor, immediately those things that they know that aren't acceptable, they begin to tuck those things away. Why? Because they know that I should be living a life that is separated to the Lord, a life that is pleasing to God, and when other people see me, They see a light that is shining in the darkness, and they're saying, there's something different about that guy. There is some, he lives a life that is completely different than anybody that that I know. Oftentimes, I was speaking to another missionary at a missions conference one time, and they say, the average Christian, they say, oh, I live a good life. But when you look at them, what does that good life look like? When I look at you and I see a good life, person that is unsaved, and I look at a good person who is a Christian, can I tell the difference? Because there are many a good unsaved person who you would give your keys to your house to and say, oh, when I go away on vacation, can you check in on the house? When, and, and they do all these good things. They're really good people. But there should be a difference between your life and a good person who is unsaved. You should be able to tell the difference, not just from those people that we often think about when we, like Hollywood and uh, criminals and all these different things. There should be a clear contrast between us and them. But there should be a clear contrast between us and even the good people who are unsaved. There should be a light shining in us and a hope, as Philippians 4 says, uh, when, whenever we trust in God and things are going bad, there should be a hope that passeth all understanding. We should not understand it, but we should know that God is with us, and no matter what the trial may be, people see a light shining in us and through us, and they say, there's a difference in that person. I want to be like them. I want to know what it is that they have that I don't. First, to to walk as children of light, we need to be walking in love. Second, we need to be separating from sin. But third, oftentimes, is one of the hardest, We need to be calling sin, sin. That's one of the hardest things that we see. At the end of verse 11, it says, Rather, reprove them, those unfruitful works of darkness. We need to be not just separating ourselves from sin, but when we see others others living a life of sin, whether saved or unsaved, we need to be living a life that reproves those works of darkness. Oftentimes, We're content with letting our brothers and sisters in Christ just continue down a path that is unpleasing to the Lord because we're too afraid to go and confront them about what the Bible says. But Matthew 18 is very clear about that. When when you find a brother or sister in fall, go to them and challenge them. If they don't hear you, then take a witness with you. Take two or three witnesses with you and go and confront them about their sin. And if they don't do it, what? The church. Because we need to be separating ourselves from the unfruitful works of darkness, but calling sin, sin, and saying those who practice sin cannot be mentioned among us. Because we are a light. And a light that has covering on it doesn't shine forth the light the way it's supposed to. When we live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, it should be calling out sin. It should be shining forth that light because light is the absence of darkness. Or darkness is actually the absence of light, but vice versa. When there is darkness, that means there is no light. It is the lack of light that is there, and we as believers should be shining forth the light of the glorious gospel, going out into the world, sharing Christ with others, calling out sin in a loving manner, living out a life that is pleasing to the Lord, but not afraid to challenge it when the time comes. When people ask, I used to work at Wells Fargo, 
before I uh, joined up in, in when I started my ministry. And one of the person, one of the people there said, you know, what do you believe about this? And so I told her what I believed scripturally about different topics. When I left, she said, Adam's one of those Christians that, that I can get along with. Because while I disagree with him, he tells me what he believes, but he doesn't just attack me and attack me and attack me. He tells me the truth, but I know that he's doing what he believes is best, and he's hoping to convince me of what he's, what he's doing. There's nothing better than being a believer who other people, even though they don't agree with you, can still be around you, and they still can see the light of Christ in you. When they can look at you and say, there's a difference between you. I may not like it, but I at least can respect it. And when we live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, and we are not afraid to say, I disagree with this sin, and we are just saying, sin is sin, and I'm not going to apologize for calling sin sin, but I can still love you, and I can still try to reach you through that. Rather, reproving those works of unfruitfulness and to say, enough's enough. Let's purify our churches. Let's go and let's work in our own lives, looking at our own lives and saying, Lord, show me the areas that I need to purge in my life because without purging, there can be no growth. Show me in my life the areas that I need to take away so that I can grow in Jesus Christ, so that I can go and be a light to the world. Where are these dark spots in my life? Where is the light not shining forth to others? Why am I not shining forth as much as I should? Asking Christ, saying, God, I want to walk as a child of light. Help me to walk in love. Help me to separate from sin, but help me also to call out sin when I see it. Help me to submit myself to those things that God has called me to be a part of and help me to be a light to those who need it, whether they are saved or unsaved. Help me to be the light that I need to be. Help me to shine forth, and I hope that is a blessing to each one of you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, Lord, would you come before you right now, just um, humbled, Lord, that you choose to use us, that you choose to accept us into your family. Lord, just help us each to Walk as children of light, Lord, just to walk in love, loving one another as Christ loved us, to separate ourselves from the worldly practices, but not to be afraid to challenge them when the time comes for us to challenge them and to show forth what it is that God says about these different things, Father, and that we would be a light both throughout this world, Father, both to believers and unbelievers, and that others would see Christ in us. I pray for Faith Baptist Church here, and just pray that you would just make it a light to everyone in this surrounding area, and that many would come to know Christ through the ministry of this church. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. I'm going to ask my deacons if they'll make their way forward. And uh, just give you a chance to stretch a minute as we go into the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. This is a command of God given to the local church. It's what the church does as often as it chooses to until the Lord comes. And, um, and so uh, at Faith Baptist Church, we strive to do it once a month and uh, usually on the first Sunday of the month. And it's an opportunity for us to reflect honestly in our own lives. We here at Faith Baptist Church practice close communion, which means that if you know the Lord Jesus as your personal savior, you followed him in believer's baptism by immersion, and you're a member of this church or a church of like faith and practice, then we invite you to participate with us. The local church is is the avenue in which we celebrate or honor the ordinance. But in this celebration, It is a personal responsibility to look inward. This isn't an opportunity for us to look around and see who's taking communion and who isn't, but it's an opportunity for me to look at my own heart and say, am I taking the crucifixion, am I taking the cost 
that it cost my Savior, the price tag that my Savior paid, am I taking it for granted? Am I taking a careless look at it? And am I living a life that has sin in it? And so the Bible says that we are to examine ourselves and to make sure that we do not have sin in our lives. I've often said that communion service is a time when we should be as close to God as at any other time. Why? Because we are looking honestly to see, is there something I need to confess? Is there an action that I've been doing? Is there an attitude that I've been harboring? Is there something God has asked me to do that I haven't been doing? Is it something that I should be doing that I haven't? Is there just something in my life that God has been addressing? Maybe it's something that has come out of my mouth. Maybe it is something that is uh, an attitude of my heart. But I know that there is something that God has been dealing with me on. Well, communion is a chance to acknowledge, God, you died for that sin. And you died and gave me new life at my salvation. And that new life is a privilege to help people see Christ in me, not sin. And so therefore, I want to confess my sin, which means to agree with God. It simply means to say the same thing. So if I have anger in my heart, I don't say, oh, forgive me, I've been a little ticked off lately. No, you call it what God says, and he says it's anger. It is sin. God, I have harbored anger. And it is an offense to you, and it is an offense for which you died on the cross. And I'm sorry. I'm confessing it as sin. The Bible says that as we do that, God is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is an amazing gift that God gives. It's an also an illustration for how we treat one another. And so what a wonderful time to just stop and do business with God. Acknowledging as we examine ourselves. The Bible says, examine yourselves. And uh, the idea is, is so that God does not have to judge us. And so you may be seated at this time. <clears throat> 